Cheers and salutations to everyone that's joining us. We have ourselves an incredible special guest that is joining us today, this early morning on Wednesday for Hard Lens Media. She is an author of the book, A Lie Too Big to Fail, The Real History of the Assassination of Robert F. Kennedy Sr. Uh, and joining us here now, first time joining us on our show, give a huge shout out to Lisa Peace. Thank you so much for joining us here for our viewers and subscribers. Can you please just give a short introduction to who you are? Tell us a little bit about your work because we got a lot to talk about and so little time. Yes, we do. Uh, I wrote a book about the Robert Kennedy assassination. I researched it for about 25 years and wrote it for about 10. Uh, so there's a lot of great detail in there. And of course I'm here today because I see some parallels between the recent shooting attempt at Trump and what happened in the pantry in 1968 in Los Angeles, where Robert Kennedy was killed. You know, mm -hmm. there's there's a lot to really address with what happened on that unfortunate event that took place in uh, Butler, Pennsylvania, where two people were injured. Uh, one person lost their life. And of course, Donald Trump literally dodged a bullet. One could say, yes, it did clip his ear, but I only can dread to think what would happen on that day if things went south really quickly so uh in regards to what happened towards donald trump what are some of the comparisons that that you see for what happened with rfk senior because you know we're, we're we're now getting a lot of i guess quote unquote armchair general experts on social media saying this could have happened or this was going on but there is there is an overall truth with what's happening and even reading your book and seeing some of your other previous interviews, the story about what happened to RFK uh, Sr. is by far extremely fascinating because what we've been told doesn't so really match up to, 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 to uh, is, 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 is so different than, than what the truth is. So I want to give the floor to you to, if you can elaborate just a little bit more. Oh, yeah, there's there's so much to parse there, but I mean, in a nutshell, what happened to Robert Kennedy, supposedly he gave his acceptance speech, he walked off the back of the stage, walked into a pantry area and was shot by Sirhan Sirhan. That's the official oh. story. And that's partly true. He did, you know, win and walk off and he was shot at by Sirhan Sirhan. Mm -hmm. But it, it, from my research, it's clear Sirhan was firing blanks in a hypnotic state not knowing what was going on with no idea that he was part of an assassination conspiracy. And I want to give you a contemporary example of that. There were two women in um, Korea, South Korea, who killed the North Korean leader's half brother, who at oh the God. Korean leader thought was a challenge to his position. And they thought they were acting out as part of a TV stunt. And they had been kind of groomed and trained to do right. these weird stunts without asking questions. And they were paid each time. So they showed up and one was given a spray you know, bottle and the other was given a towel. And they didn't know that the towel had a VX nerve agent on it. So the woman sprays the guy with water. The, guy, the other girl wipes him off with the towel but the guy falls dead within a couple hours. Now, are they guilty or not? It's like involuntary manslaughter, maybe, but there's no way anybody could argue that they consciously tried to kill him. They thought they were participating in a stunt. Now, wow. add, now add a level to that. In the case of Sirhan and possibly this shooter here, I strongly believe he was hypnotized. And I, I hate, this is why I wrote the book, because... When you talk about this on the air, it just sounds so weird and fantastic. And people either believe it or they disbelieve it and they go about their merry way. And the thing is, I encourage every American needs to read about hypnosis and how powerful it is and how long. I mean, we're talking, God, it's like 70 years now the CIA has been using hypnosis in its operations. All right. You would think they're pretty good at it by now. And there's a lot of advantages to having not a hypnotized assassin. That's the popularized mythology. And the guy who looked into the CIA's mind control documents, Jonathan Marks, wrote a really interesting book called In Search of the Manchurian Candidate. And at the end of the book, he concluded it doesn't seem like they ever created a mind controlled assassin, which of mm -hmm. course I would argue with, but it does in the bottom of you know the last page of the book he has a really interesting footnote saying why would you bother it's so much easier to hire a real skilled assassin or a skilled sniper or whatever mm -hmm. 
um, the reason to do a mind controlled patsy is what it's for because the patsy can be set up and given a motive in advance and made to look guilty through actions they don't even know they're doing through hypnosis and then they can be convinced and in my research it appears that when sirhan was in the pantry he was triggered by the girl in the polka dot dress and you can read about that in the book mm -hmm. uh, but he went into, and by the way, I don't think she was his hypnotist. I think she was just given the trigger to, you know, turn him off as soon as Robert, turn him on rather, as soon as he mm -hmm. came. But he, under a different hypnotist, he thought he was back at the firing range and he pulled out his gun and he thought he was firing at targets. And what I found in my research is Sirhan wasn't even firing bullets. He was firing blanks. And if he had been firing bullets, he would have hit Kennedy square in the chest with his first shot because his first mm -hmm. shot was wide open. After the first shot, people, you know, scrambled to protect Kennedy and move Sirhan's gun away. And by the second shot, the, the uh, maitre d' had grabbed a hold of him and pushed his gun away from the crowd. Mm -hmm. And even so, it's like there were bullet holes there were bullets in the walls, not one of those bullets, none from the five victims who had bullets pulled from them besides Kennedy. All right. So wow. had a bullet removed from him, six, five other people. So six people total had bullets removed from them. None of those bullets matched Sir Han's gun. And in the pantry, there's also strong evidence that there were, you know, at least like 16 bullets. And I, I lay them all out in my book. You know, there's an audio tape that shows at least 13 but the guy who analyzed it said at that point there was such pandemonium, there may have been other shots and we couldn't tell because there was the noise level had gone up so much with people screaming. Well, the, now, now lo looking at it, cause, cause I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of something uh, of, of my time in the Marine Corps. And that is like, you know, when, when you, when you're firing rounds down range, you know, at least you know what, what, what weapons you're using, you know, and of course the, the, the shell, you know, the, the casing counts, everything else. Cause you have, you have to have accountability, but the thing is, where, where's then the police work? Because if the ballistics don't add up, then what the hell happened? And on top of that, too, they're lying. There, 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 there's, <laughs> there's, 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 there, there's the other issue. There's the other issue of, uh, and I guess maybe, maybe we're going a little bit ahead here, where there's people talking about, well, there was potentially two other that, that there were two shooters at the Trump yeah. event. Now, again, yeah. folks, a, a lot of stuff is coming out there, and. All of this is still developing and evolving as we go along. I mean, right, recently, right, right now, anything it, we say yeah. right now is speculation. And precisely, it took you know, it took twenty years. Here's my big beef: it took twenty years to get the RFK investigative files from the LAPD actually released to the public. The LAPD originally didn't plan to release them at all. They started to write their own version of the Warren report. They did three drafts and realized that. <coughs> No matter what they said, it sounded like a conspiracy. So they just opted not to release it at all. And of course, it was pried loose through some lawsuits, especially because one of the uh, the chief of detectives had written his own book on the case using some of the secret files. And so other authors were able to say, well, hey, if he can use them, why can't everybody else? But because the files were kept from us for 20 years, by the time people realized there was really strong documentable evidence of conspiracy, the press, the media, the stories had all taken such foothold that you sounded crazy if you said anybody other than Sir Hanshot Robert Kennedy. And, mm -hmm. you know, I still get that to this day. And I just like, well, you know, you can have your opinion, but I've actually spent 25 years reading the files. You know, mm -hmm. whose opinion do you think is more credible? <laughs> it was clearly a conspiracy. I mean, there were clearly not just two gunmen. I, I argue there was at least three or even four gunmen. And again, the beauty of the plot is when they all fire at once, it's hard to tell the shots. It's hard to separate mm -hmm. how many shots there were. And and when I heard the, the tape of the shooting of the Trump shooting, I had the same thoughts like there's multiple guns going off. Now, of course there were multiple guns because there were at least two police snipers shooting mm -hmm. back at the sniper that was identified Thomas Crooks. You're right. Um, so maybe that accounts for all those extra gun sounds and the irregular pattern, which to me indicated clearly multiple guns were firing. But maybe not, you know, all it takes is one or two other bullets from somebody else and we might not hear it or know it. Right. Um, 
you, you know, know you, somebody in the crowd, sorry, I was going to say if somebody literally in the bleachers, you know, had a little tiny pistol in their hand, because I found out the CIA has concealed weapons, like a cigarette case could actually be a gun. They, in the CIA's museum in DC, there's a, there's a little gun barrel that literally can sit in your hand. And when you move your, there's like a ring on your finger that pulls the trigger and it'll like fire a bullet right between your, you know, mm -hmm. fingers and no one would even see it. I mean, there are other possibilities. And what I don't want is I don't want the FBI saying, oh, we got the guy. It's only him. Let's only look at Thomas Crooks. I really hope they're investigating all possible trajectories. Did they match the shells back to the gun? Did they find all the shells? Were there other bullets that they were able to match to the gun? You know, the person that was shot in the crowd must have had a bullet in him. Did they get that bullet out and match it back to the gun? Or or are they just assuming there was one shooter and we got him? Because I think in the case of the police, in the Sirhan case, a mm -hmm. lot of the police just assume, well, we got the shooter. You know, what's the big deal? There can't be anybody else. It wasn't until days later that all the evidence of conspiracy started adding up. Now, the, now the thing is, what's fascinating in your book and what you've brought up in other interviews is that you know this unfortunately what happened to rfk uh, senior is is a tragedy it should never have happened in the first place who knows what kind of world we'd be living in if jfk and rfk senior were not assassinated maybe it'd be better who knows that's one to speculate but this wasn't his first attempt or this wasn't the first attempt on rfk senior's life and the, the where i'm going with this is that you know it's it's quite clear that the kennedys jfk RFK and to some extent Trump seemed to really trigger those in the establishment give or take and yes there's a lot of people that get emotionally involved or have some sort of parasocial relationship with thinking oh this person's a bad guy because in social media now you have so many people that are easily triggered you have we have a rise of mental illness and a lot of people are susceptible to propaganda viewing well that political uh person that politician is a bad guy or that politician is a bad mm -hmm. guy and what I'm getting with this is that you know, this leads for the opportunity of, well, if we fail at this attempt, we could try here. And, you know, it's 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 one thing to be, be made very clear is that is, you know, we, we want to think our institutions are squeaky clean. We want to think that, <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we, that. We, 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 we live in a better world. I mean, he, that would be nice to see. I would love to see that. But as uh, you know, I have learned and as all of us have learned, that's not what it's really all about so maybe we can mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about these other attempts that were done on rfk senior and also for the fact that well if this was going on where was the site security where was the additional security for rfk senior and on top of that too i just want to relate this as well you know the site security for trump after hearing what the secret service director was even bringing up they, uh, they didn't take into account other buildings where i i served in the marine corps we did urban combat training and you know, even anything that wasn't in our security <laughs> zone, we had to take into account, okay, there's a water tower there. There could be a sniper there. We should have a react team ready to exploit that area or ease of that. We should secure that area to make sure no one has the high ground advantage. I mean, just right, her right. answers were absolutely pathetic. But anyways, I yeah. want to give the floor to you. Yeah, I was, I was shocked when I heard her testimony the other day, and I'm really glad she resigned because I wouldn't feel any of our leaders are safe with that woman in control. <laughs> oh my gosh. Even, even AOC was shocked, like, oh, wow, we're protected by an incompetent person. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if it had been me, the first thing I would have done is flown to the scene and tried to talk to everybody who was there. What did you see? What did you hear? And find out, you know, I find now there were like text messages of the cops trying to say, hey, there's a shooter here instead of using the police radio. And they had different radio systems and and mm -hmm. so. So, yeah, lots of security breakdowns. But back to your question. Now, in the RFK case, I don't have proof. I have suspicion of earlier mm -hmm. plots. Okay. In the JFK assassination, though, we do have proof of earlier plots. In fact, there was a plot to kill JFK in Chicago before he came to Dallas. My and there hometown? Was even, <laughs> yes, yes. There was even a guy arrested, and unfortunately I didn't prep, and I didn't go look up the guy's name again, but it's easy to find. And mm -hmm. I believe it was Edwin Black who wrote a really good article about the Chicago plot to kill JFK. But there was a guy, another like Marines, very similar background to Lee Harvey Oswald. They have a cookie-cutter template, you know, the disaffected loner. 
And it's funny how many of these disaffected loners there are in these cases. And of course, the true story is Oswald had plenty of friends. They just, you know, weren't the, the kind he should have had. If he was a communist, why do you have all these right wing friends? You know? So yeah. you know, his story never made sense. But there was there was a plot to kill uh, Kennedy in Chicago and they arrested the guy and his team. Um, I want to say Thomas something. I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, and then there was an earlier plot in uh, Florida that was warned about where somebody was supposed to shoot Kennedy from a high building. And that was the Miltier story. Joseph Miltier told this story in advance and it didn't happen. And then there's uh, Richard Case Nagel, who uh, went into a bank in September and shot up the bank and later said he did it because he didn't want to be part of the Kennedy assassination. And, <laughs> you know, evidently he'd been sent to kill Oswald, but he didn't understand what the plot was and he didn't think Oswald was going to shoot him. And anyway, uh, but his arrest timed with letters to Hoover warning of a September plot in DC, one of which Nagel claimed he'd wrote himself because he'd heard about it. Now in the RFK case, there were, there was an incident where some of the people from the assassination story, like a girl in a polka dot dress with a guy who either was Sir Hand or looked very much like him, because as with the JFK case, there were some lookalikes of Sir Hand running around, you know, a dark, curly, Hispanic, you know, or Arabic looking guys. <coughs> Excuse me. That's there were fine. multiple Sir Hand lookalikes at the hotel that night. Um, one of them seemed to have a bad acne condition and was seen by a bunch of people with a girl in polka dot dress, but Sirhan did not have a bad acne condition. And uh, he hinted that something big might be going on that night. And, you know, he had a bit of a lisp. I mean, we can define these people very separately. And it was clearly not Sirhan. And yet it was like he was maybe a backup patsy if Sirhan hadn't pulled it off or if Kennedy had gone the other way. Because when, when Robert Kennedy came out of his, uh, finished his speech, there were two places he could have gone. He could have gone right through the pantry to the press media, or he could have gone left and down the stairs to the public celebration, because the upstairs was actually a private ticketed only event. It wasn't open to the public. That was the private victory party. And uh, so how did Sirhan and, you know, the girl in the polka dot dress even get into the private mm. party? Well, there was an associate, Michael Wayne, who, who was begging press passes off of the media and, and very insistently and managed to collect a few and evidently seemed to hand them out in the pantry right before the shooting began because a press pass is like an all-access pass. If you have a press pass at a political event, you can pretty much go anywhere. And, uh, and so that, you know, Michael Wayne is a very interesting character with a background that strongly suggests he was uh, closer to the Nazis than the communists, mm -hmm. you know, very far right winger. And so what was he doing at Kennedy's event when Kennedy was being this anti-war liberal protester? Uh, yeah, lots of unanswered questions there. He had uh, Keith Gilbert's card on him. Keith Gilbert had tried to blow up MLK at one of his speaking <laughs> events. I mean, the, there are these weird nexuses. And and by the way, I just want to give a shout out to Wendy Painting and her amazing book, Aberration in the Heartland of the Real, about Timothy McVeigh. Because I think her book brings like a common thread in all these cases together and shows how these people are kind of found, half found, half created. You know, there's, you know, the guy was alone. You know, and now I'm talking about Thomas Crooks. You know, he was a loner, mm -hmm. but was he acting of his own? How did the rifle get up there? People saw him climbing the roof. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if they said they saw him with a rifle climbing the roof. Did somebody put the rifle up there in advance? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I know the rifle was still there. I saw a video this morning where the police and the Secret Service were talking and pointing yeah. to the rifle. but, you know, and and again, where was the ladder? How did he get up there? <laughs> you, you know, there's there's there, there's a lot of things that don't add up, and especially with the the, the shooter that tried to, to take Trump's life. You know, uh, I've seen a, a couple of uh, YouTubers who are prominent, you know, a gun YouTubers who did a breakdown of what happened and the type of AR-15 uh, that uh, Crook used. 
you know, an AR-15 is, is part of the, you know, M16, M16A4, A2, M4 carbine family. But uh, the, the type of AR-15 and optic that was being used was absolute crap. Um, pathetic. Um, but mm, kind of like it, the Malinker Carcano in the JFK case. Yeah, yeah it's like it, it's exactly. Crap weapon. It, it, yeah. it is. It is. Now, of course, it's a deadly weapon. But in comparison, you know, uh, one could make the argument you really could have done so much better with a different choice of weapon. But this was the worst type of weapon to use. And the thing is, what what I what I find uh, interesting is that. You know, you, you have a lot of people that are not well in the head. And I think because of the Internet, because of social media, fake news, AI uh, and games, our, our corp- I, I our, think our, games our, yeah. are corrupting our minds. Well, well I mean, it was, it was video games uh, more or less. Uh, yeah, I, that, that's that's a, that's a conversation uh, altogether. But uh, it's just like people are easily susceptible to be tricked or manipulated mm-hmm. into thinking, well, if I do this. I'm a hero, or if I do this, you know, this, this, this will, uh, I, I'll forever be remembered as somebody who saved well, the world. It's funny you say that because that's actually what caused me the most suspicion is that he had no ID on him. And in in my book, I, I quote a police chief who said, usually when somebody has no ID on them, it's to allow their associates to get away. And if he was doing it out of an ideological motivation, if he really wanted to try, you know, kill Trump because he thought he was a danger to society, mm-hmm. he would have taken his ID. He would have wanted people to know. He would have left a statement behind, I killed Trump because, you know, like the Unabomber or mm-hmm. uh, the guy who killed Lincoln, Six Semper Tyrannus, you know, mm-hmm. that's always to tyrants. People who want the notoriety make sure they are known. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, now Sirhan didn't bring ID because like I said, and, and this guy didn't bring ID. And I think in both cases, it was to allow co-conspirators to get away. And again, not even a conscious act on these people, but probably a hypnotic suggestion, you know, mm-hmm. leave your ID behind. Don't bring it with you. You know, you know? <laughs> so, so then uh, look, let's, let's go ahead and address the big elephant in the room. Then Let's talk about everyone's favorite three-letter agency. No, not the FBI. <laughs> Let's talk about the CIA. Because yeah. in, 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 in your interviews and in some of your writings, you, you, you have brought up the fact that when JFK was unfortunately, when his life was taken away, um, you know, RFK Sr. called up the CIA. And apparently the Kennedys have, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm surprised by this because I, I wouldn't. Yeah, and a, right. A, a, a relation, a good relationship with people of the CIA, which I would not want to be associated with any of those people. And I also want to bring up this very interesting caveat too, because uh, a, a friend just reminded me that I did a segment over a year ago, and this was uh, 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 on May eighteenth, twenty twenty three. And the video that I did was RFK Jr. convinced CIA had dealing in his father's death. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this was an interview from Hot Boxing with Mike Tyson. And I just want to share this with everybody because it's it's nothing has changed. So this is my video that I did. I won't be playing it, but this is a video and I will be sharing this link. But in the comments section, I had the original link to this interview that Mike Tyson did with RFK Jr. Now, the interview came out two years ago when I clicked this link. Mm. That's Mike Tyson's video that had over like three, maybe four million views. This video has been removed for violating YouTube's community guidelines. And that video was two years old at the time. Now three wow. years. So, wow. I, I mean, again, I, I will be more than happy to share that link. Maybe Mike Tyson re, uh, re-uploaded onto his YouTube channel. But when I click on that original link, it is it has been removed. And, and uh. so I just want to get here, I guess – what RFK Sr.'s relationship was with the CIA when it came to his brother's assassination, JFK, and also mm-hmm. with RFK, uh, the, the Kennedys continued association with CIA and really the, some of their manipulation and tactics that they have done in the past because they're not this honorable Michael Bay kind of organization that fights the bad guys and has all these secret super moves. They can be really slimy and insidious. So, Right, the but they will tell you that's who they are, and they're very convincing in that. And oh, we stopped these terrorist attacks, and you don't know what we've sacrificed to keep you safe. And people do believe that or fall for that or or whatever. And 
you know, I would argue, obviously, if we didn't go overthrowing democratic leaders in other countries, we wouldn't need to send the CIA in because they would be stable and they wouldn't be attacking us because they'd be having great lives of their own. And uh, anyway, so the CIA and RFK Jr., yes, right after JFK was killed, when he you know, got the message from Hoover, he his very next call was to the CIA's duty officer. And he said, did you guys kill my brother? That was his very first call. And I find that stunning and appropriate because RFK had been riding herd on the CIA. In fact, it was funny, JFK almost appointed Bobby head of the CIA, but because he worried that they were out of control. But Bobby's like, I don't want that job. <laughs> you know, he didn't want to be the AG. You know, he didn't want to, you know, look like nepotism. But JFK's like, I need somebody I can trust. And JFK later told his friends, it's like, I should have put Bobby at CIA. Uh, so anyway, but he'd been riding herd on them because he found out they were trying to kill Castro. And Bobby absolutely did not want to kill Castro, and neither did JFK. This is a subject that has been grossly misrepresented in the media, even though the truth is out there, as it always is. There's an IG, an inspector general report that the CIA did when the first stories broke about the Castro plots, the CIA did its own kind of internal damage assessment, IG report, who knows what, you know, who's talked to the media, who hasn't, and what can we say? And they asked their own question in that document, can we claim we had executive authority from the Kennedys for these plots and answer their own question? Not in this case. They said, we, you know, only told the Kennedys about the plots that had ended. We did not tell them about the plots that were continuing. Uh, you know, so who's running the country if the CIA runs operations and doesn't run it by the president? This is my argument and has been my argument for some time now that we think the president runs the country. But in fact, the presidents are usually run by the CIA, even Donald Trump, even the most aggressive, independent person we've had in decades in the presidency could not get the JFK files released. That's how powerless any president is. They literally can't even get the JFK files released. And he yeah. tried, you know? Oh. <laughs> well, well, you know, he. I, I, I guess if I had to bring a comparison, you know, CIA is kind of making himself look like the Praetorian Guard, just like how the Praetorian Guard was able to dictate who would be the next Caesar. At one point, the emperor meant something, and then it became an office to sell to the highest bidder. So, okay, so who is exactly. running the country? Who's in charge? Who is uh, at the ones and twos? So yeah. it was all this. Say, well, oh, who does the CIA answer to? And I'm like, they really don't. You know, it's people think, oh, the rich tell the CIA what to do. That's not true. In fact, in my book, I quote. Jay Rockefeller, who a lot of people don't understand, is John D. Rockefeller IV. He's direct descendant of the John Rockefeller. And he's like, do you, he sat on the CIA oversight committee. He's like, do you think I actually have any oversight? Do you think I can stop them? You know, do you think they will tell me the truth? You're, you're, you know, you're crazy if you think that. <laughs> and this is, again, from a Rockefeller of the highest level saying, I am powerless against the CIA. That's what... J. Edgar Hoover said, because the, the CIA was blackmailing Hoover. He's like, I know this was a Mayhew operation. Uh, the CIA had hired Bob Mayhew. Uh, they First of all, they infiltrated him into the Hughes organization and siphoned off all of the rich man Howard Hughes' money. So again, who was in control of that relationship? It wasn't the rich guy. It was the CIA. Uh, they seemed to have killed him at some point and then made his death uh, elongated the period of his death so that they could finish transferring his funds before he was officially dead. Let's put it that way. Wow. You know, so this this notion that there's somebody above the CIA, the CIA has, you know, the immunity, the secrecy, the networks, the power. And, you know, I do use the, the CIA to mean, how do I want to say, the people who run operations. I do not mean the people at the top who are appointed. And some people say, well, you can't say JFK was an institutional hit because the top guy didn't approve it. And I'm like, the top guy doesn't approve anything in CIA. He doesn't, the top guy doesn't run operations. The top guy is a bureaucrat. 
you know, who, wow. who answers only to what people below him tell him. And they just don't tell him about those plots. If they didn't tell Kennedy, they're certainly not going to. And they said that, by the way, in the IG report, they didn't tell John McCone about the Castro assassination plots, even though he was the head of the CIA. They're literally trying to kill a foreign head of state a few miles offshore, you know, after we've already had a Cuban Missile Crisis. But they won't tell, you know, the the head of their agency or the president. This is this is the country we live in, and until mm -hmm. people come to grips with that, I think we keep changing the president, hoping that's going to make a difference. That's not going to make a difference. What's mm -hmm. going to make a difference is changing the intelligence community, and you know, finding a way to pull their funding until we figure out what exactly they're doing. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, there are CIA operatives who brag about you know printing money when they need it. You know, uh, there's there's so much that's happening out of control. In fact, that's one of the reasons JFK created the Defense Intelligence Agency. He wanted to move the CIA covert operations out of this cowboy, you know, banker, lawyer, son, independent operators into strict military command. That was his vision. And I think he was right about that wow. to move that part of the CIA, but he was killed before he could do that. He set up the DIA, but before he could move the CIA under it, he was killed. Jeez. Oh. So with, with all this information, I, I know you've had some, some contact with, I guess, RFK Jr. And everything surrounding him has yeah. been you know, qu quite you know disappointing. But also on top of that, you know, with, with all this revelation, especially with, with what I brought up earlier, you know, that interview that he did with Mike Tyson, uh, mm -hmm. again, had about Well, I showed interviews. him the evidence. He yeah. has long thought that Thane Caesar, Thane Eugene Caesar, who was a guard at Kennedy's elbow, killed mm -hmm. his father. And there's a lot of good evidence to think that, although I actually think the fatal shot came from a different shooter. And that's way too long to talk about here. So see my book. But the day Thane Caesar officially died, I say officially because he may have been dead years before, and he may still be alive. We haven't really been able to confirm that he was dead. Um, but the day he officially died, you know, uh, Bobby called me. He's like, come over here and bring any pictures you have of Thane Caesar. And so I did. And he was looking for a particular photo and finally found it. And then he's doing his little Instagram post and having me read it and count the words and make sure it you know, fits the thing. And and, you know, I said, by the way, did you know Caesar was CIA? And he's like, what? And I'm like, I can prove it. And I had these um, documents from these uh, third party databases. There are these things called public records aggregator. Every time you vote, every time you take out a bank loan, every time you have to list your employer somewhere, Caesar listed CIA contract agent, even when working with addresses that included the Mormon church and Detroit um, General Motors, which, by the way, at that point in time was run by a CIA woman, <laughs> which most people don't know. You know, it's like and the thing is, I, I have even more evidence at some point. I will do an update, you know, and and, and talk about the even more evidence that Caesar and we, was CIA. And, and we would love but to have Bobby, you on the show to talk about that. Yeah, exactly. Maybe in a few more months. But uh, yeah, because I, I want to put that together. But it's clear that Caesar was working for the CIA. So you have a CIA guy literally standing, holding Kennedy, possibly shooting him himself and definitely holding him in place for other shooters. You know, how is that not a CIA operation? And, and the sad thing was in the research community, which, by the way, is just not that good <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> they had really gone down this, the mob killed JFK, which kind of makes no sense. I mean, the mob killed RFK, even though they'll say, well, the CIA killed JFK, but the mob killed RFK. And I'm like, if the CIA killed JFK, they would absolutely kill RFK to keep him from exposing their role. I mean, these two <laughs> cases go together. You cannot separate them unless, of course, you're a CIA agent in the research community. And I would argue there are several of those. But uh, <laughs> so so uh, there's, it's, it is it is rather interesting that, again, that even after all of this, um, and I don't mean to deflect or, or not deflect, but maybe deviate away from the conversation. But, you know, you have RFK Jr. who's running for president and yet his current campaign manager is CIA. I know you took the words right out of my mouth. I, I had to pause. A X. Oh, yeah. X. No, no, no. Just, just like the mob. No one ever leaves. OK, come on. So 
I, 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 can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Because also there's there's yeah. there's another follow up I want to ask about RFK Jr. that hopefully you could clarify just a little bit more. But can you just please while we yeah. still have some Most time, people, just, what's right. going on? When you when you join the CIA, you are basically joining a cult and you really can't get out unless you take some extreme measures. And maybe in her case, maybe she had a super rich daddy or something. But but a lot of times people, you know, claim to leave the CIA, but re, remain on retainer and are the eyes and ears of the agency. And there was a story about I think this was from Whitney Webb about how the CIA was trying to plant Ghislaine Maxwell on Robert Kennedy at one point oh, as a way to control him. And that effort obviously didn't work. But then you have this CI girl marrying into the JFK family, marrying his son of the same name and having his grandchildren. And it's like, boy, talk about eyes and ears. And I'm sure she would deny this up the wazoo. And, and so would Bobby, because he completely trusts her. He trusts her with his life and okay, I, yeah, I trust not you. trust her. <laughs> and like I said, I may like her. I may, you know, be happy. She's in my family. I may think she's very intelligent, but I would never trust her. You literally can't get hired into the CIA. If you are not an amazing liar, you have to be able to pass lie detector tests and get away with stuff or you can't work there. <laughs> and she was in the field. I mean, it's not like she was some desk jockey either. She was a field operative. Yes. And her first two marriages were cover marriages. You know, they sent Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't mean yeah, to cut you. Oh, what, 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 do you mean, what do you mean cover marriages? Yeah, like people don't know how the CIA works, but you know, two operatives, you know, man and a woman, they send them into a country and they need to destabilize or whatever. It helps if they look like they're a married couple, oh, God. you know, because people ask less questions. And even if one is exposed, they think the other probably isn't an agent, you know, that it's just their spouse. But and so she's had two fake marriages. What's to say the current one isn't also? fake you know as a way to keep tabs on the kennedys talk now, about a hell of a I lie don't wanna, kids. i am not saying that is what's happening i don't want people to run with that that's not what i've said right I'm, I'm asking questions and like i said maybe she totally loves him maybe she really was able to get the other thing is like i said she was a field operative and being able to leave the cia you know they had to really trust her to let her leave knowing what she knows because she knows their sources, their methods. You know, she talked about how everybody she worked with, no one used their real names, but she knows who they are. She knows what their faces look like, you know, and, and the CIA kind of let her just walk out the door. I just don't buy it. I don't buy it. It's not normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> her story wow. does not pass muster to me. So with, with all of this that's, that's happening, I mean, I, I, I for one, if... <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd feel comfortable having a fox in the hen house, you know, because that's that's how it looks like if you have the CIA near you. But who knows? You could be walking down the street and the uh, CIA could be walking right past you. Isn't that rather frightening? But, oh, yeah. Well, I, but, I worked with CIA people and I didn't know that at the time. But I at one one of the employers I had seemed to employ a lot of people with these interesting backgrounds. And I'd hear little whispers about this and that person being CIA and one guy was like openly talking about it just as I walked into his room and then he was furious that I had heard of it. I think there's so many more of them out there that we don't know. And they're in the business world. You know, there are people on payrolls that don't really work there and they're in the media, people on payrolls who don't really work there. And even wow. the ones who do really work there sometimes are answering to a second. There was a LA Times journalist who used to send his articles to the CIA to be vetted and he got caught and fired. You know, it's like, it's okay if you don't get caught, but if you get caught, obviously you have to be like, oh. Right, obviously. <laughs> so real quick, I, I know we got a little bit more time, just, just, just a tiny bit. I want to ask you a question that, uh, you know, you recently had an interview with Brianna Joy Gray and I'm hoping that we could get some kind of clarification on this. And it was, it was rather a devastating or horrific thing to hear from somebody like RFK Jr., you know, but um, in your interview that you did with Brianna Joy Gray, you, you talked about uh, the crisis and the unfortunate disaster that's happening in Gaza, where, uh, where again, there's a genocide. Dying. Dying. Yeah, there, there, yes, yeah. that's, let's, let's be clear. There's genocide, there's war crimes happening, people are starving. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you had a, a private phone conversation well, with uh, RFK Jr., 
and and it was it was probably it. text or email because yeah. I don't remember which we okay. were doing both. Okay, I okay. didn't speak thanks. to him by phone much. Okay, text thanks, thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Could you? Yeah. I guess. But what, but what, what started I, off right and what after happened? October, right after October seventh, you know, I reached out immediately to Bobby. I'm like, Bobby, this is a gift and a test. I didn't say that part. I'd... Now I, you I'm... have the chance to distinguish yourself and prove you truly are anti-war and independent, and you can stand up, you know, for the Palestinians against the. I'm sorry. You, you, you will be president if you do that. That's what I told him. And uh, and and then I said the test part, of course, is the test of morality, you know. And and he's like, Lisa, don't you understand? The Palestinians are trained from birth to be assassins, and they name their streets after killers. And I'm thinking, what? And he's like, and there's a rich guy who pays them. They get paid every time they kill an Israeli. And I'm like, if that were the case, you know, one, they wouldn't be so poor. You know? And two, they they would all be out there with guns killing. You know, Israel wouldn't exist if that were true. It's just, but I just knew instinctively that's just crap. And who told him that? And he's hanging out with this guy, you know, Rabbi Shmuley, who even <laughs> most Jews don't approve of him. I mean, this guy is like really, you know, a Mossad agent. I don't know how else to call it, but somehow he is in Bobby's head. Early in the campaign, Bobby had made a comment to Roger Waters because Waters had said something, you know, pro-Palestinian or it might not even even been that. It might have been about some other topic. But when Bobby supported him, that's when Shmuley started calling him anti-Semitic and Bobby like dropped everything, ran to talk to you know, the rabbi Shmuley and bow down, you know, to him and, you know, mea culpa, mea culpa. And I, at first, oh, I think it was a picture from one of Roger Waters' things that I saw. Because I, I I knew Roger Waters' music, but I'd never seen his act. And he does this basically anti-Nazi act where he brings mm -hmm. out these Gestapo-like characters. Oh, yeah, and, the wall. And the he, wall. yeah, and he, yeah, exactly, the wall. The wall. Right. And he, you know, tells, you know, asks the audience, are there any homosexuals out there? Are there any Jews out there? And his whole point is to try and get you to feel the fear of what happens when you live in a fascist state. But there is no way in hell that anybody could ever accuse him of being anti-Semitic. And the German government has evaluated him many times because they have strict rules that you can't get in if you're anti-Semitic. And they've let him in time and again, because when you look at his act, it's the opposite of that. It's defending the Jews against the Holocaust and what happened there. Um, but anyway, so Bobby had to kind of disavow Roger Walters, Roger Waters, mm -hmm. which was step one. But anyway, I talked to him, other friends talked to him. And in one of the conversations, and like I said, it may have been by phone, but we didn't usually talk by phone. It was usually text or email. Mm -hmm. But at one point he's like, you know, I said, they're going to kill them all. And he goes, maybe it's better that way. And that, <sighs> that just was like a dagger in my heart. And it's, it's, it was so shocking to me. It was like, I literally, it, it was like, yeah, it was like the soul had left his body. I was so upset. I was so upset. And I went online. It's like, I can't support this guy anymore because he's okay with genocide and I am not. And that is the bottom line for me. Now, I, I actually co covered that segment uh, of, of that interview that you did with Brianna Joy Gray, and I did get a couple of comments that said, well, wait a minute, hold on. Was he, was RFK Jr. talking about Hamas, or was he talking about the Palestinians? Mm -hmm. Like, could, could you clarify? Because th that's yes. one thing. That yes. was, was, well, it, was it all of them, or was it just problem. one group? Here's the problem. To Bobby, every single Palestinian, even these newborn children, are Hamas. Ah. That is racist. And I told him that. And that was our last conversation. I'm like, Bobby, you you can't equate every Palestinian with Hamas any more than you could say every American is a Trump supporter or every American is a Biden supporter. Neither of those are true. You can't say every Palestinian is Hamas. But he would not back down. And I've seen him on TV say, well, if you can show me a way to get rid of Hamas without getting rid of Gaza, I'd be all ears. And, you know, oh, okay. 
Well, that's that's yeah. uh, that's that's very horrific, and it's going to just uh, make me sick horrific. to my stomach for for quite some time. But uh, yeah. w- while we are, I think we are now out of time. I do want to pull up your social media. So here is her Twitter account. Please follow her. We do invite you to please come back onto our show again. Oh, thank uh, you. Because this was a very eye opening. Because now I have a whole other treasure trove of questions I want to ask you, especially about. Hypnotism, mind control, all that other kind of crazy stuff. Because yeah, we need uh, to all get yeah. more literate about hypnotism but, and what the power of it is incredible. I will, I will reach out to you and I will have you back on the show again. And also, folks, if you haven't bought her book, uh, this is right now a link to it for on Amazon, A Lie Too Big to Fail, The Real History of the Assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Folks, if you haven't read it, please do so. As a final note, uh, Lisa, where can people follow you online? Or is there any kind of events that are happening so that people can know where to follow <laughs> you and support your work? So let's go ahead and yeah, get, de- get definitely that follow me on Twitter. That's the best place to find, you know, if I have an upcoming event or some new book or whatever, that's where I will be announcing it. So you should definitely follow me there. Okay. Fantastic. Well, that's a great or X, I guess it's called. There is no X. Twitter anymore. I, I, I actually I actually call it Phoenix. I actually call it Phoenix. You have the bird, you have the X, and Phoenix is Phoenix Fire. But, yeah. It's 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 I I think it's actually a good, yeah, it is. I, I, I think so. Put me in the naming, put, put put me in advertising, coach. I'm ready. So uh, n- nonetheless, thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna continue on with the rest of our main show. So if you want to learn more about Hard Lens Media, live every Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Central YouTube, Rumble Rock and Odyssey and Kick. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. We're just going to have a few short second break, and then we'll start with our main show. So thank you again, Lisa, and all the best to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. They 
is you till you felt like you'd forgotten your name or life before they had you contained oh, oh, oh. life before they had you contained SWAT team took your neighbor today